I'm Tammy Lee Meyer, and I'm joined by Arthur Brock. Thank hey, Tammy. You. Good to be here. Yeah. Uh, so I would love to have a conversation with you about the Sovereign Accountable Commons. It's one of the pieces of your work that I'm deeply inspired by. And I'd love to open a dialogue between us to kind of look at what it is and just look at what some of the implications of that might be in terms of collective work. Yeah, cool. Um, well, I can say a little bit about even just why we call it a sovereign accountable commons when it's kind of like our counterpart to it, what in the blockchain world is called a, a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, uh, for us, there's some design differences around Holochain and Scepter that we've made different choices than blockchain where rather than sort of like abstract away humans from the equation and pretend it's all about smart contracts running on their own or something like that and tokens that exist on their own tokens or coins that exist on their own um, our architecture is more agent based it's more based on that any piece of data was asserted by somebody by some source you know and any action is being taken under somebody's agency, you know, and um, for us, we've kind of built our architecture around recognizing that agency and wanting to create a dynamic of what, what we call mutual sovereignty. So like in the, in the reg, in the old school political world, you know, a lot of our politics polarizes around the power of the group versus the power of the individual, you know, and, and are we taking a more kind of libertarian, completely individualistic stance, or are we taking more of an authoritarian, the state gets to tell you what to do and you have to, you know, follow the rules for the benefit of the state. And nobody, for the most part, really likes the way both of those extremes play out. And yet the power dynamics that we have keep them bumping, keep them like keep that tension in place, pulling right. against each other. Yeah. Um, and part of what we see things like Holochain enabling is new ways of holding things together. Yes. So the cryptography being used to ensure data integrity instead of like putting walls around the data about who can access it and, and that kind of thing, um, which is the old school way of managing data security, right? Data integrity is collapsed with data security. We're not gonna let anybody get access to it because then they can mess up the data. Well, if you can build the data integrity in cryptographically, then we can all hold it together. And what that enables is a different power dynamic between the group of individuals. So what, what we believe that enables is a new kind of mutual sovereignty where the individual maintains their sovereignty as does the group. And it's not a one over the other because the way it works is if you want to play in the group's context, you play according to the group's rules, but everything that you create and contribute is still yours. Meaning in the world of digital assets, <clears throat> copying is is cheap right so as you contribute things whether that's whatever blog posts or content or votes or ideas or discussion post you know what anything that you are contributing like in in Facebook you upload all those things and they're Facebook's yeah you know, Facebook could terminate your account for whatever reason according to their policies and you basically have no recourse can't go to court and say you have all my photos I uploaded and I want them back you know um, you, you don't have any of those rights the group in that context has complete sovereignty over you as an individual right and but in a whole chain context you still have locally stored in your node participating in the shared system all the things that you created. Now you also published those out into shared space. So the group still has access to those things, but the group can't use its power to take away your value. And in fact, um, in most cases, it's also 
an open oh, source. Oh, there's, there's that spin cycle. I'm definitely hearing that. Let's just pause for a moment. I love how the life is interpenetrative. Things are happening all around us. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'd love to just do a bit of recapitulation around what I see your work as just to do that work. Um, so in terms of, oh, we've got, I, we've got more sounds. I, I think so, but you're the one who can tell whether you can hear them or not. I can't tell. Well, we'll just carry on. All right. So uh, I see, obviously you've got a big breadth of work, but in terms of uh, the whole chain and the sovereign accountable commons, those two pieces for me allow individuals to be able to have a way to be able to own their own content, to be able to choose what and how, what they may share with others. And I see that as being really key in terms of how we transition to, uh, to, to new systems that allow us to be sovereign and to shift in particular how data is handled, how information is handled and how we share our intellectual capital, right? So uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, where I'm wrong, um, but what I see that you're creating is uh, machine language that can allow any person to be able to host their own uh, information, content, code uh, on a virtual machine that they can then share with a group and that the key, so in terms of how uh, blockchain works, blockchain uh, has some deep challenges that I see your uh, work as meeting, which is that there's all of this machine power that's required to authenticate uh, what it is that, uh, to make sure that that information is the same across all of the nodes and that machine power is uh, is actually electricity uh, takes electricity to maintain so instead of using up all of that energy to be able to authenticate the information that you would hold that information on your local machine so that uh, so that a you have data integrity yourself with your key, with a similar kind of functionality as the blockchain, uh, and you can choose to share that with others as you choose from your sovereign place. And so in terms of the application of that, um, I'm, I'm curious as to, uh, so let's talk a little bit about where you are in the development of it, because of course, this summer you've had uh, teams of people working on it, and right now you're in San Francisco with you know 14 people in a house and a couple people down the street and yourself in a, a, a uh, motorhome outside, uh, and you're you're fostering and this this. Uh, so maybe you can share a little bit about what yeah where's the process at right now. Um, well, our designs for this project are part of a much longer history, you know, 10 years or more in the Metacurrency project, and then a bunch of years in designing Scepter, which is for receptor-based computing, and we think going to revolutionize all this crazy stuff. But we broke out a tiny little piece of Scepter in January, really, and started working on Holochain as something that could go kind of head-to-head -head against blockchain as a um, platform for managing distributed systems. In particular, um, distributed applications is more our focus. So it's a little bit more like Ethereum, being able to run lots of different code than Bitcoin just having tokens, you know. In fact, Holochain has no token built in because, it, to the lowest level, because it is made to be run peer to peer and already has the incentive that you're talking about. You already want a copy of your data. Of course. So let's, we, we do need to do a little bit on what the Holochain is. So. Holochain is our alternative to blockchain that allows people to 
write things to their own local data store in a signed chain that becomes their immutable record of their actions or contributions and share that into a shared space in a distributed hash table. So unlike blockchain, which is like one global ledger that everybody has to synchronize and agree on, um, <clears throat> our approach with the distributed hash table makes it possible to break that into parts so you can just know where to find different addresses of data that you're retrieving and the, when, whoever stores that data validates it before serving it. And so that randomizes who is going to validate the data that you've done, which is kind of the power of the group. Like we're going to follow these rules and we're going to validate that anything you share into the group space follows those rules. Right. Yeah. And um, the, individual part is that you have your own source chain, your own sovereignty to create the things that you want, even if you don't follow the group's rules. But if you don't follow the group's rules, the group may stop participating with you, you know, right. it doesn't take away your stuff. So yeah. there's a there's a kind of equal footing that you're able to stand on. So, so in terms of the of the distributed hash table, yes. um, which is a I mean, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to make this really feel human, right? So there are these terms that are, that are blocks for people to really understand. So mm -hmm. in terms of the distributed hash table, that would be where the group does its work and interacts in terms of, of sharing information in a form that allows inter, interrelation between specific data sets that may be required to run something. Yeah, uh, let me, can I break down distributed hash table just a little yes, bit? Please. So a hash in the cryptographic world is kind of like a fingerprint of data, right? Yes. Like if you tried to say this data is Tammy Lee Meyer, right? Like, well, that would be, that would take a lot of data to do that. But we could also say this fingerprint will be used to identify, to stand in for all the data that is Tammy Lee Meyer, yes. right? And then we're going to file all of this data by fingerprint and look it up by fingerprint. And so the hash is a kind of data fingerprint. And whenever you take data and run it through that hash algorithm, it always comes out with the right fingerprint if it's the same data. And if it's different data, it comes out with a uniquely different fingerprint. Um, and so a hash table is just a way of looking things up by their fingerprint. It's a table, okay. like an index to look things up by its fingerprint. A distributed hash table is a way of having that be, be managed across many different computers where no one computer may be holding the whole thing. Okay. Right. So it's just a way of organizing our data and being able to find it, but in a shared space. It's kind of like one big shared database. So in terms of the sound in your background, uh, for, our, for our listeners and viewers, it would be nice if it were to pause. Is there a way to do that? I mean, I think it's gonna be easiest for me to move. Okay, well, let's, let's do that. All right. Okay, we've moved to spaces. Uh, so we have less of a washing machine. We're not in the washing machine anymore. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, in terms of the, it's, so there's two concepts there though. There's the, there's the hash table itself and then the distributed hash table and what that means to actually model the sharing of information across that distributed network. Yeah, um, but distributed hash tables are not new. Like BitTorrent and all the file sharing platforms, you know, they've been using distributed hash tables for a long time. Um, and not every node on the network holds the same data and they have ways of being able to find the data in the right place. Um, there's ways of building neighborhoods and where you have like peers that you synchronize data with. So you make sure you have multiple copies and you know, things like that. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, let's wrap this piece for now. And uh, that's a good kind of intro and uh, and we are going to be making more of these.
right now. All right. 